afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, this is now the Rob and Steve show. <laughs> um, so a uh, small audible call. We're, we're going to be taking over and um, just uh, running the panel. Uh, it's going to be kind of conversational now because it's just the two of us. So um, I guess you want to start off with introductions? I can. And what the, okay. the panel is actually going to be about? Sure, sure, I can. Um, is it good? Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. Man, I'm really moderating. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the title of, of, of the session, as we all know, sort of stepping into the world of digital banking um, uh, and banking black. Um, I'm Steve Royster. Uh, I run marketing and community banking for a fintech startup called Mochify, uh, which is our short acronym for Mobility Capital Finance. Uh, we are black founded out of New York City. Uh, First location was 215 125th Street in Harlem next to the Apollo. Uh, we have grown to about 40 people. Uh, and really our mission is to provide the financial institutions that complement the social justice work to try to close the wealth gap and the opportunity gaps in excluded and underinvested communities. Uh, and so when we were founded in 2017, our CEO founder, Wole Coxum, was an iBanker. Uh, one of the numbers to uh, black bankers at J.P. Morgan Chase and small business banking. Uh, and when the uprisings in Ferguson happened, he had been working on trying to provide more business banking, financial services in black communities and said, you know what, I'm just going to start my own. Uh, Mochify was founded uh, to really serve, initially serving unbanked and underbanked and its most holistic way. So banking deserts where there just are no banks or where we are based, I'm based in Jersey City, New York, where you've got a city bank and a chase on every corner, but if you don't have the right financial profile, you are not walking into the bank, you probably have overdraft fees. And so how do we service that person to get them on a pathway to wealth? Uh, and so we started um, as a pure consumer play. We sort of did prepaid cards. Um, transitioned out of that, um, and we're building a platform similar to other competitors, uh, folks, Greenwoods and Chimes of the world, where we're structured as a fintech with a bank underneath us. We issue bank accounts, all no fees, and we were going that route. Uh, but we started, and where we are now, we're still doing that, um, and we can get into sort of banking black. Um, but we also provide, we took our infrastructure and we essentially sell it to cities who need to get funds to folks in immediate financial need quicker and more efficiently. So our customers, our first huge customer was the city of LA, um, where we distributed about 50 million in COVID funds. We've distributed 100 million to date in about 17 cities, all black and brown cities. Uh, and the benefit for the city is that in some cases, like in Birmingham, where they needed to get uh, rental assistance funds and COVID funds out to folks, they just didn't have the financial infrastructure. If you're a city, you're not a bank. You know, you're getting funds and trying to cut checks and people aren't getting it. Uh, and so we do that cheaper, more efficiently than some of the large banking entities. And then for us, when we get into banking black, we're not a bank, we're a fintech, but we have our own Mochify bank account and other white label bank accounts. So we do that. Um, but the other half of the equation is sort of, and, and to execute on our mission, we say as a company, okay, the city hired and paid us. They rented our platform to distribute funds. We have your information as somewhat of a relationship now. Let us get you on a path to get banked, build credit, and over time introduce you to people and services locally and through our financial institution sponsors and some investors like TransUnion and Truist Bank, um, to name MasterCard. And let's put together this holistic personal banking team to help you go from 600 credit score, maybe check to check, to getting financially stable, then building some credit, then getting the relationships you need perhaps to own a home, start a business, workforce development. The reason why I'm sitting here, right, is, you know, personally, yes, I, you know, I'm loving to connect, right? But for Mochify, it's to have those relationships that the brother talked about in the last panel, where structurally, 
in our card. If you have a MochaFi card, we can have programs and structures and then just informal relationships that help you get the resources you need to create wealth. And so that's what you know, banking black looks like for us, although we're not a black bank and anyone who is economically marginalized can use our platform. Now we know for all the systemic reasons that tends, that not even tends to be black, it is black. Um, but that's what it looks like for us, sort of we throw around this term of community neo-banking. So we are not, you know, we are not brick and mortar. We are digital, fully digital. Ourselves, we don't even we don't lend. We don't have credit products or home mortgage products. We're like the somewhat of a membership, if you will. Although there's no fees, it's a real bank account. But if you have that and you start with us, we want to be able to transition you. So when you're ready for a business line of credit, we are a trusted partner to say hit this bank or have this loyalty program with this particular bank that's a partner, perhaps. Uh, as opposed to another, which is sort of the work, which is the work you do, and so we're sort of we're similar in that space. But that's Mochafi. Um, I think that's what banking black looks like for us. It's really relational, intentional, but having the infrastructure, and as a for-profit venture-backed startup, quite frankly, having the capital to do certain programs, right? So having that double bottom line. Uh, so I'll stop there. Um, so I am Robert B. Herring the uh, third in Atlanta, Georgia, the third. Yep, uh, <laughs> by way of North Carolina, and um, I am one of the co-founders. Actually, the founder. I launched uh, this movement with a tweet, essentially, about um, gosh, eight, or eight, eight, nine years ago, around uh, Mike Brown uh, and Ferguson, kind of, kind of taking off. And what I was looking at at that time and what I wanted us to kind of coalesce around was the fact that a lot of the movements that we grew up seeing um, had an economic undergirding. They had a strategy, they had a point person that was trying to yield a specific response. Um, and I noticed that a lot of the movements present day were moving into optics, morale, things that we do need, but there was nobody that was being squeezed at the end of that. So I started looking at fiscal advocacy and what that looked like for us. And so at the time, we kind of joined in on and became more synonymous with the bank black movement. So that was move your money. And we quickly pivoted because it was like move your money and your bad habits. That don't make sense. You know, so it was like, what are we doing to assist you to make the choice that is best for you and your pockets? So then we moved into literacy and um, and we started moving into literacy uh, pretty heavy. We started partnering with a lot of different uh, institutions scholastically. Uh, the University of Michigan, uh, Kansas University, uh, UT at Arlington, NC State, things of that nature, and kind of investigating um, banking deserts, different disparities. Um, and the biggest thing was kind of like getting the message to the people in layman's, um, demystifying the process. Because when you start getting into, into Bitcoin and FinTech and da 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 da, average everyday people are like, huh? You know, we got to bring it down and make it normal and make it scalable to their situation, meet their needs. Uh, speak their language about what their needs are. So we um, we quickly pivoted, and, and in that pivot, we started to kind of appraise the institutions that we had left, because black banks dropped from a huge number down to maybe at the time about 17, 18. We've since gone back up a couple, but the ones that were left, uh, you know, they're all FDI, uh, IC insured, they had to play the game. So sometimes they had the same practices that the majority banks had. Sometimes you could leverage the majority banks quicker than you could, you know, some of the black banks. Um, the black banks also suffered because they weren't able to stay as uh, agile, be as digital. They didn't necessarily offer as many products. So it was how do we assist them to kind of meet the need that, and the demand that we're kind of trying to produce in them, and also how do we keep them accountable to the communities that they serve. So once we got into that discussion, you know, we became a little bit more threatening in a way, but it started more collaboration between us and those banks and, um, and looking at how to best serve those communities and how to best leverage um, the needs that we have against, you know, our local governments, national government, things of that nature. So um, we are the CARI initiative, actually, which is Cooperative Wealth Reinvestment and Empowerment. And Bank Black is one of our social narratives. And then we're going to roll out some more. But everything is kind of focused around a literacy. Um, so you can speak to your own situation independently. And then moving as an economic collective and a cooperative. And so we also pride ourselves on being a digital cooperative because what we do is share information and best practices across you know, the, the different people that we work with. Because I think a lot of times um, there's this need to gatekeep certain information and certain resources, certain tools. Um, and I'm not trying to be Malcolm or Martin. I'm trying to create as many Malcolms and Martins and Fannie Lou's as I possibly can um, and disperse 
the resources across the movement. So that's kind of where we are as the Calgary Initiative and as Bank Black. So maybe from Rich from there. Cool. <laughs> cool. This was the question I was supposed to be asked when I asked it myself. <laughs> it seems weird. <laughs> um, uh, um, so the, the topic was sort of how do we demystify fintech right. in our community? Um, I mean, I'd be interested in the audience, but I, I don't, I actually don't think tech is that de is mystified necessarily. At least I'll, I'll speak from Mocha Five being in the community, but we'll love the, the conversation. Um, but, you know, there's a 98% penetration rate in America of smartphones. Like, we're all using technology. I would say one of Mocha Five's biggest competitors is Cash App. So whenever I'm in the community, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I get an account. Can I put it on my cash app? I'm like, nah, you know what I mean? We want you to use our account. So, like, so I actually don't see people being mystified about tech. What I do see is well, a couple of things. One, because our structure in these new what you call neobanks and folks we compete with, we aren't traditional brick and mortar. So there is a question of like, well, what is it a real, is it a bank account, that kind of thing? That's one. Um, and then two is just trust, right? Because particularly as black folks, we have a right to be distrustful <laughs> of banks, right? Of the system. And so, but for us as a startup, it just feels like any startup or brand, you have to educate, you gotta inform and inspire people and they have to see you and you have to talk to them, whether it's when I'm in Compton doing, we have this campaign called On Our Block where we bring the bank to the block. So we're in Compton and Watts, and it's me, and it's my man Sticks, and it's Big Boy, and we're talking about what we do and word of mouth, right? And so once I've talked to you about what we're doing and I show you the card, the tech is like, you get it. It's an app, you got a bank account, you put your direct deposit on it, it's sitting there, it's really no different than your bank account at City. It's just that you can walk into that branch, and with us, you have to see us online and when we're in the community. So that kind of goes quickly. Um, and then what people have to trust, and you have to deliver value, and the tech is just there to make whatever we do on a day-to-day -day basis a bit easier, you know? The founder of X, Twitter, said it best, right? You know, it is X, that's what it is, right? Um, he, um, you know, and, and I'll mess up the quote, but he says technology is, technology is just making our everyday processes faster or easier. And that's all it is, you know what I mean? We still have to, a bank is just, the bank is a tool to relationships, right? And so the tech is just to make you be able to engage with your bank account quicker. Um, also tech allows us to open accounts where you don't have to have a banking history or credit check, you know, so we can verify you by just verifying your identity. It reduces some of the services we can, but you get into the banking system. So I, you know, I think it just comes down to just good old fashioned trust building and explaining what you do in a way that's simple, just like any other business would do. And hopefully, if it's folks like us and allies and people who are really committed to closing a gap and opportunity um, and building wealth in our community, hopefully over time you'll trust us. And then when we introduce the tech, it just makes sense. I'm trying to help you uh, get to a better place financially. Um, I do think it is a matter of making it uh, uh, germane, kind of drilling it down to brass tacks. Um, I think it's generational. Um, I'm in my early 40s. I won't say how far in, but um, my mother is like 62, and you would think she was like 92 the way she operates with tech. You know, so having to teach how to how to airdrop certain things and this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. like X, Y, Z, it's like a crash course mm -hmm. every time. So there are certain things that she prefers, like just a certain way. And I'm and as you go back more generations, like there are people that just still trust the brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. They still want to write a check. They still want to go do X, Y, Z. And of course, that's a smaller population, but you want to be able to speak to your broader audience. Um, I think from that perspective, and I think from the perspective of just the language of it, I think you and I are immersed in it mm -hmm. day to day. So I think we can talk and we can rap like we did you know, earlier on, and it's easy for us. I think mm -hmm. talking to somebody else who doesn't deal in finance daily mm -hmm. or fiscal advocacy or any of these things, for them it may be like, what are you guys talking about? And they may want to, and, and people are sometimes afraid to not know things. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also live in an age of, of hyper anti-intellectualism. So like they're going to pretend to know when they really don't know and then they're going to hate you for actually knowing. A lot of things, you know, social media. 
But um, nonetheless, I think that there definitely is a space of like stripping it down and showing people the formula and showing them how this is now advantageous in this space for them. Um, so I think that there is the process of making it a little a little less cumbersome in terms of approaching and, and thought. But I think for the space that you're operating in, um, it's you know you, you're B to B in some ways, so it's not it's going well, to be yeah. as hard. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, sorry. Yeah, I get it. I mean, look, if if I'm talking to someone in the community, it's like, what do you do? I'm not even talking about technology. I'm like, I'm trying to get your credit up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm connected to, you know, I was in Milwaukee. Will I was, We were talking Will Roundtree in Milwaukee, who's an influencer, real estate investor, work with us. We're talking about how to structure your life to get credit, to create some cash flow, to buy a home. I'm never talking about tech. Right. Like I'm not talking like the tech is just here to help you get money in your pocket to build wealth and take care of our family, which is the pursuit of the dream that we're all searching for. The tech just enables you. So like by the time if we're doing our job the right way, by the time I get to talking about tech, you already know what the end goal is. This is just to help you get there, right? So I and I'm putting my marketer's hat on, but like that's, you know, we're talking about how do we live our dreams, what are our goals, and then we get into like how to do it. Um, I would say that's the approach. So maybe it does need to be demystified, um, but you know, I would, I would argue that in the sense of banking black to people who need banking. Now, if we want to have a tech talk and talk about crypto and stuff, yeah, you know, but I'm not talking about banking at that point because I would argue that crypto is not. Banking is investing. If you have it, learn it, that kind of thing. But um, so, yeah, that, that would be my approach. I think and that I, in a yeah. way is demystifying. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay, that's why okay. You're in the spot that you're in, okay. so that you can okay. speak to, to that audience with that language, with a pre existing narrative that they understand, mm -hmm. and you can walk it down and say, this is what you know, A mm -hmm. equals B equals C over here. So, no doubt. No I doubt. guess we can move on to the next. Um, what is the next question on our? Uh, I get to ask you a question. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll okay. start with you. Uh, no, for both. Yeah, I'm just going to read it. Okay. Um, give me a bit of free advice. I work in government. This is as a government official. I'm, I'm playing a character, right? Uh, I work in government, and as someone who is interested in the work you are both doing, what can local or state government do to intentionally invest in black people and or partner with your organizations? So how can the government work better for the bank black movement? I mean, there's the obvious answer that we're probably all going to agree on. The government has a tab they haven't paid. Um, but you know, like you and I talked about in regards to reparations, um, you know, I think we can lean on that since we've been economically disenfranchised for decades at this point. Um, we can lean and leverage that, but like we talked about earlier, that isn't necessarily going to give us anything immediate. Um, I think in, in terms of anything immediate, we have to just shift the focus to um, pouring resources into the community that support literacy, um, that support the kind of campaigns that you and I have been talking about in terms of deploying, um, you know, Mocafi and getting it to more neighborhoods and people understanding what it actually is there to do. Um, the same thing with what it is that we do and how we highlight uh, literacy and empowerment mm -hmm. and, and banking black and what it looks like and holding institutions accountable mm -hmm. um, to the communities that they serve. What would you say about that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, definitely an advocate for reparations. Um, 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 I'm not waiting on it, but I'm an advocate <laughs> for it. Uh, but like so, but we have so from a Mochafi perspective, and a, and a Mochafi is our business model, and I can get into that. And just from a startup perspective, um, the government is holder of resources, right? I mean, what have we fought for political power? That's where all of our money sits, and politics is about getting access to that bread to do what you need to get done, right? Um, so I would say first, just um, folks who are in government. Um, whether those are elected officials or the folks that serve, as the question states, being intentional about finding and supporting through uh, from an economic perspective and access to people, but vetting folks like us, I would say we are doing the right thing, if I toot our own horn, but finding like the right partners 
who are doing the work to uplift folks economically. So sometimes, obviously, that's funding a program. Um, in our case, the government is our customer. Um, so from a B to B, business to business perspective, um, I think I did. I guess I mentioned this in the intro, but you know, um, to reiterate it, uh, governments pay us as a vendor to use our financial platform to distribute money. But not only that, it what tends to happen with us, the sort of 15 to 20 customers that we have, there is a shared social value that, quite frankly, goes into us winning some of the customers that we have. So um, like in the city of Los Angeles, the former mayor, we're working with Mayor Bass now, uh, but the former mayor had a social justice agenda in the budget. It was a billion dollar budget. I'm forgetting the name of it. It was a social justice budget to provide, to get folks better connected to city services from a digital perspective. Um, and so when we went to, we didn't, bid, but when we went to bid, we didn't have to in this instance. Um, um, but when we won the contract, part of it was, yeah, we had a product that enabled them to distribute funds faster and quicker, but our mission was aligned. Um, oh, I can, I can stop pretending to be Shagoon. Um, but, we, um, but our missions were aligned, and so just having government with that intentionality helped. Uh, but then also outside of just the money, um, government, city government, like the city of Boston, um, uh, having programs that are intentional, um, and I know of, of a few, obviously I'm not going to uh, be able to speak to those, but I know like the transit equity component, uh, GBI, universal basic income, just being innovative and intentional about programs that will help us at a macro level and then finding companies that are aligned I think is key, and then also just having access to people. So one um, component of our consumer work and our go-to-market strategy is working with public housing. So, you know, we're in South Jamaica houses, NYCHA public housing in New York, Birmingham, Smithfield, which had a big HUD award that they just granted. So we are going into the projects and ask our customer to do the work, but the city can help us with that. You know, whether that's fast tracking a permit to do a pop up or just introducing us to the resident advisors and just being an advocate for us with community based organizations because as a startup, that's who we're serving and we're trying to get access to. So um, I think just more of that, um, yeah, more of that. Well, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, my name is Shagan Iduwu. I have the privilege of ser serving as the Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion for the City of Boston. And that is why I am just now joining this conversation, because I'm sweating because I just ran from the State House, where uh, me, Mayor Wu, uh, Councillor uh, Louis Jean, and Councillor Worrell uh, were advocating for more liquor licenses here in the city of Boston because right now we have zero to give away. And if we are trying to uh, grow our neighborhoods, especially as we're bouncing back after COVID, um, our black and brown establishments, particularly restaurants, need liquor licenses because this is one way um, that uh, they help generate more revenue to pay people better wages, stay open, and possibly open two or three more. Um, and so we are pushing uh, for 250 more licenses over a five-year period. And it was supposed to end at 2 o'clock and the committee decided they had a thousand more questions uh, yeah. for those of us that were there. So my apologies, and I, I could feel Nia uh, cursing me out uh, when this went past two o'clock, but very happy to be here with you both um, to talk. Uh, this kind of uh, relates to this issue because we're talking about wealth building, uh, and part of the description for this panel uh, is around creating uh, uh, Black Wall Street. Um, and so if I can, because I, I think you've already done, you, you've held it down for 25 minutes now. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you, you've talked about it a lot. Um, but uh, but <laughs> you've done a fantastic job. Excellent moderators. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but well, I, I actually... Bag. Can I get a tote bag? Yes. <laughs> um, but I actually am, am very interested in this because, uh, like I said, the hearing I just came from on liquor licenses, I think about that for Black Wall Street, but I'm thinking a lot about the work that you both are doing um, um, which I know you've had a, a chance to talk more about. So it's a hot topic here at Black Wall Street around the country, post-George Floyd. Everyone was using the term Black Wall Street to the chagrin of our sisters and brothers in Tulsa. Um, but uh, uh, Jalen Brown signs the largest contract in NBA history and says to a question about, what are you going to do with $300 million? And he says, I want to use it to... Uh, 
create a black Wall Street in Boston, which historically has a very um, high racial uh, wealth gap. And uh, a billion people have texted or reached out to this guy to say, here's what it should look like. I want to add two more (laughs) thoughts to his billion, right? So there is a very real conversation happening with him and his team. Mm -hmm. And so Jalen, unfortunately, is not here uh, in this audience, but we're going to send him the video after. (laughs) And so some free advice to Jalen, although we will tell him to pay you as consultants. Right, right. Uh, but yes. Um, but like, what, what would you tell Jalen? He's sitting right here and he's thinking about Black Wall Street. I guess there's two questions. One is, what is your understanding or vision of what Black Wall Street is? Because I feel like every single person has their own definition and understanding. And then the second is, what do you tell Jalen are the things that he can do to help bring that about here in the city? Uh, I view it as um, a self sustained. Uh, ecosystem, you know, um, primarily economically, but across the board, it, it, it culturally, um, it's, it's self-contained. And it's something that we've, we've done many times and been thwarted. It's been burned down. It's been drowned. It's been covered up many a times. And a lot of the work that we were doing initially was to create that connective fascia between the work that had been done and the work that's being done. A lot of the current generation, um, it's easier nowadays to silo online especially than it ever has been so they feel like they're recreating you know the wheel they're 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 making it for the first not recreating but making it for the first time they're doing work that hasn't been done it's like no we've done it numerous times time and time over again so it's kind of bringing that knowledge to the forefront sharing the knowledge about what worked what didn't work that's the first thing for me um and then it, it spreads from there from how we look at ourselves as a cooperative digitally is sharing that information is, as I said earlier on, not gatekeeping, best practices, resources, connective tissue across the different academic institutions, the different financial institutions. Um, it's, it's really world building from that perspective. It isn't just, I get up here, I've made it, good luck on, on you getting up here where I am. Um, Cause that happens within our community as well too. I think that's the biggest portion is, is I can't be afraid to share with you and be as invested in your success as I am my own. Because if you do well, you know, on, on a turnaround, you can help bring me up in some areas that I need to be brought up. So I think that's the biggest thing is that level of cooperation and collaboration across the board and when it comes to best practices, ideas, innovation, um, and what the future looks like, as well as understanding where we come from. Um, I agree with all of that. Um, and all of that has to happen. Um, I'm, I'm a startup person. I'm 15 years startup and venture, and so I always think just with a product hat, right? You know, we're starting something from scratch, if you will. Although we've had parallel economies, but today, if Jalen were here and he's saying I'm starting something from scratch, um, and you have to always look at history, right? I'm just a huge history buff, not a historian, um, but history tells us a lot about why we're here and perhaps what we need to do. And so Black, black Wall Streets, Tulsa and others, are disconnected economies that ran parallel to the American economy because we were legally blocked out from participating in it. And participation in the American economy is access to credit. Whether, you know, whether we are capitalists or anti-capitalism, I'm just saying that's what it is, right? America was built on credit and free labor. And the powers that be said, you will continue to be free labor. I don't care if it's slavery is gone or not. You're going to share crop this. You know, you're going to, you know, black coal, we're going to put you in jail. This is what, you, you, are, you have no right to pursue the American dream, that's for us, and you have to work, right? And so Black Wall Street were people who said, no, I reject that, and I have to create my own economy, which were rooted in banks providing credit and institutions for people to deposit, get all the technical assistance and the culture. The culture is just going to come because it's the culture, right? We got a shared experience, right? Um, but saying, hey, I'm going to put, create an economy anchored by a bank. Give me the deposits. We will invest those deposits in your business, in your home. And so it was created out of necessity. 
and it was destroyed because folks said you should not have that, right? So that's just like what it is. And I, all the cultural, the technical assistant, like we have to have that, right? But that's, that's gonna be there. We, the culture is here. The culture is our greatest export, right? So that's gonna be it. Now today, so with that in mind and just thinking of history, if Jalen were here, I'm saying Jalen, we need some sort of financial institution, let's just say bank, you know, a bank that is intentional about providing credit to folks whose financial profile, black folks, may not look like white American counterparts because they've had a different generational track, right? Like we are behind the eight ball. I mean, we get with this and it, it, all, it comes back to credit and credit holistically just meaning, are you credit worthy? How do you manage your budget and your expenses? you know, we got to make a dollar holler to do something different. And our credit might look a little different than yours because you're going to have to pay this thing late to here to here because you don't have the foundation, right? And that's why when you see the black wealth statistics, so like, and I'll get it wrong, we know it's sort of 10x and 10% of the wealth, but when you, when you solve for like the, the income levels being the same income level, the wealth is still less from the black community because it's not about income. Wealth is just the asset. So when you don't have an asset base, even when you're making the income, a shock hits or you can't really invest because that's going into living. And so that's just a different profile of a person. Even if I took the race out, which I never, you, you can't. But I'm just saying, if you just looked at that, it's a totally different financial profile. So that means you need an institution that is going to invest in that financial profile. But like the, the, the structures don't necessarily have to be different. I'm gonna look at your profile um, and maybe the amount of money may be different. Maybe the terms of the credit may be uh, a little longer or fairer, if you will, to account for that. But that's what we need, I, you know, right? So Jalen's here, I'm saying, man, let's take that 300 million. We need some kind of credit facility. And then we need the education to get folks to a point where they are credit worthy and not like a credit worthy from my assessment of you personally, but just say, if I looked at you on the books, can you give me the loan? Can you repay the loan back? <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you in a position where you have the income and the asset and the investment, all that stuff makes sense where you can reliably pay it back so that it can go back into the bank to fund more folks, right? And so it's a general version, but that's where I would start is to say, Let's create that bank and that financial institution and extend credit to folks so they can own something, a home, a business, an investment portfolio, um, and in the process of that, build themselves up from a career <coughs> entrepreneurial perspective, a credit perspective, to be able to do those things. Uh, so kind of to this, uh, and by the way, how many folks already have a question? I just want to be mindful of, okay, I see one, all right, because um, I think we have, well, technically, we have until, what, 320? Um, I'm going to go till 345 since I... No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just checking because I, you know, I want to make sure we're getting to your questions. Um, I was late, so I'm not going to go through all these. One I did not um, make you aware of. Uh, uh, but on this point, because um, we're talking about Jalen, but now I'm thinking about all the other black people that got, that got money, mm -hmm. wealth, really. Uh, so I'll give a little backstory here. This part you shouldn't record. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was on the vineyard, uh, as folks do during the summer, I guess. Uh, and uh, but I was only I was there for work, so everyone else was there to have fun. But I was there to lead a panel discussion on black economic mobility, uh, and the panelists, who I love dearly, are all wealthy black people. And so here we are talking about black economic mobility on the vineyard that you have to drive an hour and 40 minutes from Boston to get to the ferry, get on the ferry, get over there, Oak Bluffs, and then whatever, mm -hmm. right? So talk about economic mobility and all the different, you know, you should invest your money or you should, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the question I asked them was, uh, thank you for all this advice. Now, what do I tell the black person with a 600 credit, credit score in Fessenden Street uh, who's got $150,000 in loans uh, you know, they're getting, you know, they, they have a big time job, but all stats show us that black people get paid, uh, you know, black people with degrees get paid as much as a white person with a high school diploma. So, um, so we can't base it on income, to your point. So what is the advice that I give them? Now, of course, the answers today are Bank Black USA and Mobify. <laughs> However, 
My no, audience no. right now is not the, right. the person I just described, right. but rather the four people who were on this panel who went to their homes in Oak Bluffs mm -hmm. to say, here's what we should do for poor black people. Um, who, again, who I love and who many of them came, came like were themselves, right? Uh, so um, what, I guess, give me some free advice here. And I am going to ask about government. But the reason I'm asking about wealthy black people mm -hmm. is at the same time, because I've looked up both the organizations, you, you all have partnered with really uh, big names uh, in terms of corporate America, um, well-intentioned people, uh, but this point about parallel economies uh, and the fact that it was uh, credit and free labor, we, uh, we were almost being pushed back to that time uh, via the Supreme Court. Um, and we see in Atlanta, you know, Fearless Fund as the, the case, right, but representing many others that... Uh, that are scaring a lot of white people who were making these investments and believe, you know, saying racial equity is important. But now many are retreating, at least in language, but we may see this happen uh, monetarily as well. So I want to focus on non-corporate, non-white, because to your point about history, we can't always rely on, right, on all that. Mm -hmm. What do I say? Because all of these folks need something from the city. Um, what do I say, let's say now we have a convening, right? I don't want them all to just support the bank because there's a whole lot of stuff that folks can do. How do they support your organizations and what else should we be saying to folks with means to do to help support communities um, so that uh, if and when the time comes that we are kind of pushed out of this system that we have fought to be in, um, we're not left destitute, but rather have our own economy that supports us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why don't I start down here? Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to piggyback. No. Um, yeah, no, no, I hear you. I, we, we all family, so if, you know, if we could just wrap and have a discussion. But um, I don't want to repeat myself, but it, it is an extension of what, you know, the last question. I, you know, so there are two things. One, um, Education in its holistic form, information, I think is key. That's just number one, because in one way you can say, yeah, just invest, that's what I did, um, and look at it in maybe a negative way, but on a positive way, yeah, you did do that, right? But now let's share the whole story, right? So, you know, so if you created wealth, if that person on the vineyard created wealth from scratch, or if they had a generational investment, whatever, let's tell that story and, and, and organize ourselves so that we can do that more on a systemic level, whether it's through just education and, and those folks being content creators, essentially, or small groups in our community to say, okay, here's, here's the play. This the play, right, to I came from this point where I didn't have and now I have a home on the vineyard, and these were my steps, and here are the principles, and this is how you have to do it. So I think that's, that's number one, because on a macro level, we don't collectively have the bread. We don't have the bag collectively. Yes, individually, yes. But there is no black bank, essentially, that is here, brick and mortar, to invest, and in. we talk about reparations, all that stuff. But so information, number one. Um, and so can the government support locally, whether it's just through your normal civic duty or programs to just get more education to have these conversations like we're having here? That, that's one. Um, number two, we need to find, well, three. Number, number two in the easiest way is one, to just navigate the system that's here. I'm here for being, we can be revolutionary, more so in our thought, but the game is the game right here. There's, this is our taxpayer money that funds corporate and government, and there's billions of dollars that are available at white institutions and corporations, and how do you get that? You get that through credit, right? Like our ancestors, our American ancestors have fought to this point with civil and legal rights on the books. I'm not talking about social, because everything's relational. But on the books, there is no barrier right now to walk into a bank to get 
funding if you have the financial profile. That right now we know that in reality there's always barriers, but just on from a from a legal and civil rights perspective. And so one we have to find a way to make our financial profile fit that, and 80% of that is credit. Credit is the new cash. And so I'm just big on that because that really is just a budgeting tool, right? And so we, may, we all face barriers. It may take some of us six months. It might take you two years. But there's a system in place, and there are people that are doing it that I know, we know, and my credit has been jacked up and been good, too. So I'm you know, speaking from experience that you can do that, right? So if we get ourselves in sort of position, that's number two, and I think that will open opportunities. And, I, and, and the folks that we touch at Mochify, it's the difference between you know, having access to even 1,000 in short-term capital to, to, to weather a financial storm so you're not going back two steps. I'm not even talking about getting like to a bag. I'm just saying being stable. And then when you're stable and you have some information, number three is we need investment in funding and programming so that once I am stable, I can go get the bag, right, to invest, whether that's to buy my home, whether that's to start a business, which I'm, you know, in favor of all the time at some, at some point, even if you work in a corporate job, or just develop your skills to the point where you can to pay for education to get to the point where now you still are making that income, but you have this wealth education and this pathway to increase wealth, and then over time that will happen. I, I think that's the path. And so I, I will look at Jalen again, like let's take that 300 million and create a whole paradigm in a system, whatever that 300 million, that's his contract. He ain't giving up his whole contract. You know, whatever it is, the 50. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, so that's, I, I think that's the key. Uh, to parrot conscious, uh, consciously, uh, education is elevation. I hate to keep beating the dead horse on this one, but um, what our, our job is, uh, at the Calorie Initiative, is to kind of best equip you to address your situation because each situation is different. Um, everybody's economic situation is different. Um, even when we kind of start to bring community amongst those, uh, the groups that we work with, um, every locality has a different perspective. So what we want to do is just avail the most tools and most resources for you to be able to address like your individual situation and the one facing your community at that one. Whenever we were working with the University of, I want to say Michigan, we had to read the color of money and the color of law. And you start looking at all the different systemic campaigns that are going on. And it's disjointed in the books. Like it bounces around to what we've dealt with from blockbusting to redlining to Jim Crow. But when you get like a timeline and you look at it and see how much of it overlaps, and it's concurrent, you're like, we've been under onslaught for so long, it's how do you begin the process of undoing all of this? And that's why I keep saying education, because it gives the appropriate context to like what we're up against, how long we've been mm -hmm. up against it, mm -hmm. and, and what we've tried to do to kind of undo some of it, and, and how we can modernize that approach uh, present day and then kind of traverse forward. That's been the whole thing that we've been doing, is trying our best to amass and avail as many resources and as much education, as many tools to as many people as possible so that they can put it in their quill and say, okay, this is, I need this, this, and this so I can go forth in addressing my particular situation. Everything else you said though, totally echoing that. Yeah, one, one, quick, yeah, one quick thing too. I, I, and just thinking of it, even my statements, I mean, I think the other piece for government, I guess, and I don't know this, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legislator, um, but there still is bias and discrimination in credit. There's credit redlining, and we know that happens even though on the, the, on the laws on the books are there. So just continuing to look at that in some enforcement measures, like I don't know what that is, but there are cases that we read all the time, particularly around like appraisals and home ownership and walking and banging capital, you know, there's still that component. So still working through those so that we can cut those barriers. Oh, okay. Sandman said... Wrap it up, um, but I, but that would be an area I will focus on. Yeah. So I see. I'm going to start here with, with my brother here and come. And I see this question right here, um, and I'm going to give a little commercial break because uh, Nia told me to, to do this because um, I want you to come up and talk about what your before your question. Well, first of all, let me just say no speeches in search of questions. All right, that's because all of our folk we love to you know. Um, but the second, but I'm, but I'm going to give a little thing because I want people to know what it is that you're doing with Nubian Markets, and um, uh, and I said a commercial break just to say that the city is developing a commercial acquisition program. So much on the housing side, the city does a lot to provide down payment assistance to help folks buy their first home. 
Uh, nothing exists on the commercial side. So a lot of small businesses, they're renting from usually non-black or brown property owners who are raising the rents every year now. So when we talk about gentrification, it's not just on the housing side. Commercial property, that's why a lot of our businesses have to leave where they are. Nubian, Nubian notion, I wish, I wish we were around before they, they, got, they had to close up. So we're developing this program to help our folks not you know, be able to rent, but to own the property that they're in, which is important for wealth building. Mm -hmm. I want this brother to talk about Nubian markets, like 30 seconds, right? And uh, you know what you're doing, and then ask a question for these for these brothers. Oh, thanks, Shigun. Good to see you. So, by the way, I was we catered that event on the vineyard, so oh, I, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was there, and you asked that same question. So I was so thanks for asking it again. But yeah, but um. No, real quick, Nubian Markets is, again, a celebration of us in the space in, in Roxbury. Um, and it's right in Nubian Square that stands on the shoulders of all the, all the activism that was happening in the neighborhood um, prior to us actually being able to advocate for us to own the space within the development that was happening in Bartlett. So, again, 7,000 square foot uh, full service grocery store, except for alcohol. We don't sell alcohol, so. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the other piece. But we are one of only less than 10 black owned full service grocery stores in the country. Uh -huh. um, and it's right here in, uh -huh. um, in Boston. And so we're working on a couple other um, potential sites. So, you know, banking, you know, hey, what's up? Um, but my question is really around <laughs> we're about to go through this large, and you touched on it briefly about what you are, all, all are doing in the city to ensure ownership can happen so we can have the type of spatial justice that we need to create our, our cultural spaces and community. Uh, but this is like the largest transfer of wealth in American history with, with all of the, the boomers about to retire. Um, what is happening to, to capture these dollars, create what this brother's talking about, and create an institution that can serve us with a different set of ethos that's not based upon these extractive realities. Because that's kind of, if we don't shift it, we're going to continue to just sit, you know, in this other very extractive and oppressive paradigm and trying to cobble together whatever we can to just exist in spaces that don't want us here anyway. So yeah. that's my question. You touched on what you were doing in the city, but that's kind of on the banking side and how, how can we get together to do it? And the follow-up question, if I can, is how we structured the deal. We were proximate during, during the time of, a, of people being woke <laughs> to say this is how we're going to move our dollars differently. And so we said no to certain dollars. We guaranteed that it was zero interest. We guaranteed that it was patient capital. And we don't have the type of debt that will, that, that's coming in right now to deals. But because people were willing to listen to that because, but how do you capture the types of deals that happened during the time of, of wokeness to continue to, to deliver it now and not let that energy go away? So those are my two questions. Mine is a little different. I was really curious about this conversation around education. And I think that a lot of the conversations I've heard today have focused on community, neighborhood, collective wealth. And I think that when we're talking about um, FinTech, it, it is inherently personal and individual. And so with education, where is the space or what are the questions or techniques you're using to ensure that people are also unlearning scarcity by talking about money? Because to your point about the vineyard, yes, it's very interesting, but what we don't talk about the vineyard is the fact that you had so many black folks who bought houses with community and family during the 50s and 60s because as city workers, that's what you could do. Oak Bluffs used to be not the place you wanted to touch for a reason, right? And so I'm always curious, and I naturally am biased. I am a vineyard baby for sure, and I am a descent. I come from those family members where like, we had no money. But we collectively purchased familial-wise, right, and community-wise. So where's the conversation around that as you're, as you're getting your individual wealth together, continuing that conversation and education so that it is coming from community in layman's terms and not necessarily, you're great, you're wonderful, but not just from the three of you, but that people are taking that conversation and encouraging it. Because talking about money is hard. And even with folks who have money talking about money and how they got it, is hard, right? And that is, that's patriarchal learning that we have to do. So I'm curious about where that shows up in your conversations. Um, 
Um, one, I got to get to Nubian markets. I'm, I'm from Jersey City, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back. Um, uh, that sounds dope. I, I, and I think it sounds like you maybe both were kind of asking the same question, maybe the first question of just kind of getting, and if, if I've misunderstood it, apologize, but like, I think both in terms of education and thinking are related. Like education, thinking, conversations are related. I think the one thing that I think is happening um, is just leveraging the internet and media where you have brands and content creators and individual folks who are working to make talking about money and wealth cool, for lack of a better term, or just socially acceptable. I think part of it is we need to play in this system, which is a capitalist system. And I know like there's the debate on both sides and uh, there's perhaps the type of capitalism that is not destructive. But from my view, we have to play with the hand that we have here. And that means we have to talk about money, how to get it, invest it, and all of it. And I think out of that, then just naturally, you will start talking about pooling resources because not one person has it because we ain't got no money. Like, you know what I'm saying? On a macro, right? Like, so that's what I think. I think it's, it's just, it's, it really is the education and the, and, and leveraging media to make these conversations more, um, uh, routine and popular to have. And I think you see that, the earn your leisures of the world and, you know, kill a mic. And our competitor was not really our competitor, Greenwood. Like, you know, say what we want about, you know, all the stuff that's happening. But, I mean, it's a conversation. He has been having that conversation. Like, just to name a couple people, I think we just need more of that. I think as one way to sort of to, to drive the conversation and educate folks. Just to clarify, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. Their phone or whatever, but that media literacy and technological literacy is yeah. impacting it, right? Because you're getting all this advice about start your LLC, get this car, that's how I got my whip. We saw right. everything with PPP because there was no education, and we were being taken advantage by these larger banks. So I guess I'm curious about like but how I, do you yeah, get yeah. that information and if yeah. we're having a comfortable yeah. conversation. Like if me and Tommy is having this conversation, yeah. I can come and say this is my plan. Yeah. I'm not gonna but I, but I think, uh, and it's a great debate, but I think the flip side is you have people who did use PPP and you got people who are building wealth. And the same person that took that PPP and got J's and the Escalade was going to do it when it wasn't no PPP. Like, we've been doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and we don't have the luxury as black folks, but that's just American consumer culture that happens all the time. And I, and I think kind of the flip is... It's like we get, excuse my language, shitted on because the narrative is always like you're inferior. Like, no, like we might be falling into the trap of America, but that's America. This whole damn country is consumer driven. And uh, you know what I'm saying? So like, it's not like it's unique to black folk because we stupid and don't know how to manage money. Nah, we like integrated into America. Now, we need to change the thinking because we are worse off, but I think you have also folks who are educating themselves. And yeah, you gotta be able to, weed through the, the information, but that's just that's just where we are. So take it, go get a book, <laughs> you know what I mean? And and but that's part of that conversation. And I don't have all the answers, but I mean I think you see it on both sides though. Um I think it's an ongoing dialogue as well. Um, yeah, one yeah. thing we try to do is pair it with scholastic research and we partner with like I said University of Michigan, Kansas, UT uh, Arlington, NC State, because we like the things that we do to be vetted and to be backed by some actual you know, qualitative and quantitative research. Um, the other thing I always challenge my team to do is to keep the conversation, I always say first make it sexy because this is this can be heavy. And so how do we make this every day? How do we make it something that we can talk about like it's housewives? Like what do we do to get it down to that level? Um, but I also challenge them that we, we find a way to, to drive it and keep it going and not at the expense of black bodies. Because what happens is somebody gets shot, somebody gets killed, our, our website analytics tick up through the roof. Everybody wants to know how to give back, what to do, X, Y, Z. That dies down, we march a little, we cry a little, we carry on, and we go back to status quo. So my thing is how do we keep this discussion going? And this is an ongoing debate. We don't have a solution just yet, but we're trying to say how do we keep this dialogue going when, it, when it's downtime, per se, but we don't have to activate in that manner. And it's hard. It's challenging because you're up against all kinds of algorithms, you know, club renaissance, you're up against whatever came on last night, you're up against whatever the, the topic is today, you know, how do, who's paying the bill, how do we split up the brunch bill, 
is going to be the argument for the next three years on Twitter. How do you how do you fight that? How do you get the attention of people and say like this is about us and our future? This is about us as a collective. It's about how we make decisions politically. You know X Y Z. So it's it's an ongoing debate. There is no definitive one answer. But I think if we all collectively say this is my solution, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, yeah. and we all deploy them all. So um, I, I I'm getting the signal that. Uh, we're supposed to wrap up, but I'm going to take the moderator's privilege because they're not going to take away the mic while the camera's rolling. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I, but I am going to add one minute. It's to say, um, uh, kind of working backwards around the education piece, certainly government needs to do a better job. So even to this point about um, you know, folks are kind of proliferating this information online and, and people are just accepting and moving forward, certainly at least on the local level are not doing a great job of jumping in front of what's being proliferated and saying, here are the trusted resources, et cetera. But also the work that we should be doing to support organizations like Ujima and, and those represented here and others that might be in the audience. Because quite frankly, people trust, and I probably shouldn't say this either, but like people trust you all more than they trust government, certainly, for yeah. uh, important <laughs> reasons. Uh, and, and therefore, we should be doing more to invest in the Ujimas and others so that you know, as things are going out that may not be the best advice, there are trusted organizations right. that are putting, that kind of pushing back against uh, that. On this uh, question about um, the transfer and transfer of uh, wealth, yeah, there was a journal article a few months ago that said something like $60 trillion is about to change hands over the next decade, mostly in inheritance. Um, and, uh, and we know that we're not like a, a big part of that, but I would say that part of what we're thinking about here, I mean, I think this is one reason that a lot of progressives push for the millionaire's tax here in Massachusetts. Um, certainly the legislature just took some steps to kind of, you know, change that a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about how the state is capturing that wealth transfer and what we're advocating for. So like, you know, the mayor inherited $500 million in ARPA, America Rescue Plan money. And my team got roughly maybe 30 million of that. And I mentioned this, the uh, commercial acquisition program. There's the space program that we just launched, just second round just today. Uh, you know, so if you're a small business owner or looking to open a storefront, please apply $9 million, $200,000. I know, I know, I know, I know. Sean is here to tell me to shut up. But, I'm ju but just to say that like, you know, we're, it's, it's okay. I'm already, they, they already hate me. Um, but uh, but just, just to say that, uh, you know, um, but on the government level, we're doing what we can, at least in Boston, to harness that money that we're capturing and to put it in communities of color. So I say we got about 30 million. I would say probably 70% of that money has gone to communities of color. Now, find me some other, find me in Boston's history where 70% of our money is going to black and brown people. I, I, you won't, you know, ever. Um, and so, and, and I want to boost that number, right? Um, but it's not, you know, this is temporary. ARPA is gone by 26. And so a lot of the programs that we're putting together right now around ownership, around development, we're going to launch an initiative to help get 300 or more thousand dollars to black businesses to help them scale their capacity so they can get contracts from the city. Right now it's, well, it's 12% now under us, but it was 0 0.4. But anyway, let's, we'll save that for another panel. But to say that um, the programs we're putting in place now are meant to, in the future, capture that money and put it back in the in the communities. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. All these folks that are inheriting this money of ensuring that on the private side they're making these investments mm -hmm. that are important. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Sorry for being late. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hey, good, good, good job, good job. We made it work. <laughs> we made it work. Um, <laughs>